and you'll probably all get a wee message that will say that this is being recorded or something for you to click to say you're okay with that. So without further ado, I'll just introduce our speaker for tonight, which is James Sylvie. Now, James has got a very diverse career in basically species that he has worked with and helped conserve. Uh, and it's a huge range of species that James has worked with. And I've known him in a number of different roles. Uh, and I think his actual current job just shows how much, in fact, that he has done in the past. And he's the, a senior species and habitat officer with RSPB. And he basically looks at conservation of a very wide range of species. So this can be from mountain hares to the pine hoverfly. Um, he's currently working a lot on beavers and beaver ranges. But he's also working on species on the edge. Now, some, a lot of you might know about Species and Edge. If not, I really encourage you to have a, a look up of that one online as well. This is a project with lots of different conservation partners across Scotland that are looking at species in coastland or coast edges. So they're on the edge because they're on the coast, but they're also on the edge in terms of they're very rare and they've got conservation, the need in conservation because they're on the edge of survival. So they're on the edge in two ways, hence the species in the edge. Really exciting project. Really encourage you to have a look at that one uh, as well. So James, in his own time, does a lot with entomology. Um, in fact, and, and has done a huge amount for a number of species of entomology interests. So mainly insects. In fact, I think the last time I met James in person was in a very wet butte in the middle of the night in a field looking for glowworms. Uh, was the last time I, I saw uh, James, which was absolutely fascinating to go out and do. Um, but as well as that, obviously, Keen Birder as well, I'm a ringer with the BTO, and he worked or volunteers with the Scottish Raptor Group regularly, has worked on various conservation projects with a variety of birds. Um, but really, tonight's talk comes from his time when he worked with, with the Waterville project in the Trossachs. And that area, of course, is very good with uh, cuckoos. And this is where uh, James got his love of cuckoos that he's going to be telling us about this evening. So over to you, James, and thank you very much for doing tonight's talk. Thanks a lot, Stuart. God, that, that sounds like an impressive CV when you say it like that. That's all right. I like that. Uh, okay, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully. Stuart, do you just want to tell me once you can see it in presentation view? Yes, I can see it in the... Oh, it's in presenter view currently. Ah, that's it. Okay, right. That's so there you. might be a bit of a delay then on uh, the slides. I'll make a note of that. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, my name's James Sylvie, and today I'm talking to you about something that has nothing to do with my job, which is quite nice, because normally when I do these talks, I talk about project work or species that I'm involved with at work. And although I work for the RSPB, everything that I've done with cuckoos comes from a complete amateur point of view, so all in my own time. So I'm definitely speaking to you as a enthusiastic amateur when it comes to cuckoos. If you want to talk on the, the real hard science of cuckoos, then uh, there's people in the BTO who know far more than me. So, But all my observations kind of come from uh, spending time in the field. Uh, as Stuart says, I used to work on the uh, Trossachs Waterfall Project, which was based in Aberfoyle, and that's an area that's just absolutely hoaching in cuckoos. Um, uh, and as a child, I was completely yeah, entranced with cuckoos. I, I grew up in culture uh, area was completely dominated by arable, so there was absolutely no chance of seeing a cuckoo. But I remember watching it must have been life with David Attenborough and seeing, you know, a cuckoo chick uh, pushing the eggs uh, of a reed warbler out of the nest, and just thought, oh, one day I've got to see them. And so the trossachs was really my first opportunity to do that, and I've just kind of spent every spring since then chasing cuckoos around either the central belt of Scotland or a little bit further afield. So that is where this kind of talk comes from. Uh, I'll give you a bit of a background on the structure. So first of all, we're going to go through the ecology and biology of cuckoo. So I'll introduce you to what a cuckoo is and what a cuckoo isn't. Um, we're going to start right from the very basics. The only thing that I'll assume that you already know about cuckoos is that they make the call cuckoo. 
they're common in clocks and uh, that they're brood parasites. They like to lay their eggs. In fact, they need to lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. But other than that, hopefully I'll cover most of the major bases when it comes to telling you about cuckoos. After we've done that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the current status of cuckoos in the UK. So that's uh, we'll cover England, uh, Wales and Scotland. And we'll talk about how they're doing from a range and trends point of view. And then finally, we'll finish up um, talking a little bit about a recent sabbatical that I did this year on the Isle of Col, which was all about um, working with cuckoos out there. So a lot of the pictures uh, today come from that sabbatical, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, and then we'll hopefully have time for questions at the end. So let's, without further ado, start off with what makes a cuckoo. So the cuckoos are a really uh, successful group of birds. There's 144 species of cuckoo, which might surprise you. When we talk about or think about cuckoos, we just think about our cuckoo. Um, and as often happens, uh, thanks to Linnaeus uh, and the fact that uh, the uh, our cuckoo is the cuckoo, but you go to anywhere else in the world apart from Antarctica, and they've all got their own cuckoos. And a lot of cuckoos are brightly coloured. They come in all sorts, sorts of shapes and sizes. Not all of them are brood parasites. Some of them are, but just lay their eggs and look after their young like any other bird. And some of them are even um, social nesters. So the birds on the left-hand side, those blackbirds, uh, they're annies from South America, and they breed socially with multiple females laying in a nest. The nest can have up to 20 eggs, uh, and they all take turns, uh, uh, and they all uh, chip in in rearing the young. So they're a really diverse group of birds. As I said, 144 species split across 38 genres. So, yeah, really successful group of birds as well. And taxonomists don't really know where to put them. So you look at some papers and they think that uh, they're closer related to uh, a bird called the Hoatzin. If you've never heard of that, that's a, a really weird looking bird uh, that lives in South America, one of the most primitive birds we have in the world. Uh, so some group them with them, others think they're more closely related to grebes. And when you get this kind of um, disagreement between taxonomists, it's really they don't know. And so what normally happens, and this happened with cuckoos, is they say they're an ancient lineage. Uh, so they've been around for a very long time, uh, and that's cuckoos. As I said, lots of shapes and sizes. Uh, these birds you might not recognize, but I'm sure you recognize this one. Yes, the roadrunner of Arizona is a type of cuckoo. As well. so that just gives you an idea of uh, the, the wide variety uh, of uh, shapes and sizes that cuckoos come in. So what about cuckoos in the UK? Well, uh, cuckoos really from the UK and across Europe, there's a lot of folklore attributed to them. Um, a lot of mysticism as well. Uh, they uh, ex exist as lots of different symbols in lots of different uh, cultures, anything from uh, associated with love to uh, associated with uh, fools or um, cheating. But one of the things that we've known for a very long time is that cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests, but what we didn't know was how. So when you look at the ancient Greeks who saw the cuckoo as a harbinger of, of love, um, they knew that they laid their eggs in uh, other birds' nests. They just they just didn't know how. And until fairly recently, really the last 150, 200 years, well, 150 years, um, it, it, it wasn't known. What was thought was that the cuckoo laid its egg, picked it up in its feet, and took it to another bird's nest. So they're a real bird that had a lot of mysticism about them. And that's probably because... There were a bird that appeared seemingly out of nowhere in April and then disappeared quite early as well. They look like another species. You know, they look quite similar to a sparrowhawk. So a lot of people thought they turned into sparrowhawks in the winter, um, but no one really knew really what was going on. So a, a, a bird that, um, yeah, there was a lot of folklore attributed to it. In Scotland, a lot of our cleocal names uh, are associated with uh, crews. So if you've been to Edinburgh, you'll have seen that one of the Lothian buses that goes to Pennycook, I can't remember the number, uh, but that's got the cuckoo on it. And of course, Pennycook means uh, hill of the cuckoo. They were also known as the gork or the gout. Uh, and that's uh, an, another word that's associated with uh, fool. So uh, the original April Fool's Day in Scotland was the middle of the month, and that was Gelk's Day. Uh, so it was associated that um, with, with cuckoos and when cuckoos came back, which was around the middle of the month was meant to be a foolish day because the cuckoo was thought to be a bit of a fool. So lots of different symbols, lots of different mysticism around cuckoos and a bird that has really fascinated a lot of people for a, a very long time. But let's talk about the cuckoo now. So cuckoos are 
around uh, uh, an average weight of 115 grams. So they're a medium sized bird. So that's about the same weight as a blackbird, uh, but they're very long winged. So their wing length is similar to that of a sparrowhawk of which they, they look quite similar to, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so um, yeah, a medium sized bird with proportions that when you see them fly, you would think, oh, they've, you know, a very long tail, very long wings, but you know, not when uh, um, sitting very unlike anything else. They've got something called zydactyl feet. So if you look at this picture, if you look at the bottom, uh, if you look at the bird's feet, you'll see that it's got two toes pointing forwards and two toes pointing uh, backwards. That's characteristic of, uh, of cuckoos as a family. So zydactyl feet essentially means two toes forward, two toes backwards. Other species that have that are um, woodpeckers, but also um, parrots as well. So uh, if you've ever had a close look of, of a parrot or you've got a parrot at home, you know, that's the typical uh, foot pattern, and that's the same for cuckoos as well. Uh, they've got a heavily barred chest. Uh, that comes into them looking a little bit like a sparrowhawk, which we'll cover in a second. And as you can see, this is an adult bird, an adult male. Um, they've got uh, gray plumage. The females are very similar. Uh, they've got that black uh, tail with white spots as well, um, and that's diagnostic as, uh, um, of adult cuckoos. The only color, other color form that they come in is uh, a brown color form, which is similar to the juvenile plumage, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, but that's very rare. Only about 1% of cuckoos has, uh, has that plumage. And it, it's almost never seen in Scotland. It's more seen down south. So this is your typical uh, looking cuckoo that you'd see in Scotland. So in the hands, this is about the size of them. So this was a bird that I caught uh, uh, on call. Um, so as you can see, not a massive bird in the hand, but you can see how long those wings are and how long that tail is. Um, yeah, a very uh, interesting bird to have in the hand. Uh, those yellow uh, feet and yellow eyes and yellow bill are, are really striking when you've got them close up. So the bird here, a juvenile. So this is what the, once the juveniles fledged, this is what they look like. Um, so that color form that I spoke about, that Rufus color form uh, is very similar to this. Um, but this bird will have only just fledged. Uh, it'll migrate down to Africa and we'll cover the migration in a second. And it will molt down there into its uh, adult plumage and then come back the following summer uh, to breed. So when it returns back to the UK, it'll look like an adult. It'll have a few juvenile feathers probably, uh, but generally it'll look uh, as a complete adult. So I've mentioned a couple of times that uh, cuckoos uh, look a little bit like sparrowhawks. So this is uh, a couple of pictures that show you a cuckoo in flight just to kind of show you that um, that image. So it's something called Batesian mimicry. So if you've ever heard of this, it's where a harmless or non-toxic species uh, imitates a harmful or dangerous or toxic species. So you often see that the classic example is in butterflies where there's lots of butterflies that are completely harmless that mimic um, harmful species. Um, in fact, there's lots of insects that do it in general. Lots of uh, insects pretend to be wasps or bees. Look at hoverflies, for example. Lots of hoverflies try to look like wasps and bees. That's uh, an example of Batesian mimicry. And that's what you're seeing here. The picture on the right really uh, shows that quite well. So this is a cuckoo in flight, that long tail, the barring on the chest, those long wings, it looks quite similar to a sparrowhawk. Um, and the idea behind that, it, it's thought that as the birds are flying over areas, it's scared, you know, the little birds see this, the little birds that they're wanting us uh, to lay their eggs uh, into the nest of, and then leave the territory, you know, they, they alarm and fly off. To be honest, in the time that I've watched um, cuckoos flying around meadow pipit areas, no meadow pipit thinks that a cuckoo is a sparrowhawk. You know, they know what a cuckoo is. Um, but perhaps in areas where um, birds are, uh, um, you know, not familiar with, with cuckoos and more familiar with sparrowhawks, this works. And maybe as well, it, uh, it perhaps works in uh, stopping them being predated. You know, they're not a particularly large species. So something like a sparrowhawk or a goshawk would quite happily make a meal of a cuckoo. They spend a lot of time sitting out in the open, making very loud noise. So they're quite conspicuous. Um, so maybe there's something in that as well that uh, a predator might think about giving uh, uh, a bit of a miss, thinking that it's a sparrowhawk. Um, but there you go. That's a bit of an idea of uh, Batesian mimicry and what the, the body plan of a cuckoo is uh, yeah, trying to look like. Okay. Uh, cuckoos are and what cuckoos do. So you're probably aware that cuckoos are migratory. They're only with us for a very short amount of time. So I thought I'd take you through the cuckoo calendar. So I thought I'd start with where we are at the moment. So we're in November, so where are cuckoos right now? 
Well, our cuckoos are somewhere around the Congo rainforest. So most of them will be just north of it, but some of them will have moved into it. And this is where they're going to spend the majority of their winter. This is where they want to be. Um, what they feed on on there is largely a bit of a mystery. Perhaps they're feeding on similar prey items that they feed on in Scotland, or maybe they're feeding on an abundance of termites. Um, the um, tracking studies that we'll, we'll talk about in a second have shown that these birds are moving whilst they're there. So perhaps there's a bit of following the rains, following the abundance and glut of food. But yeah, this is where our cuckoos are. And this is where our cuckoos are spending 40% of their time. So when we think of our cuckoos and when you, you, know, you go to areas of Scotland, the glens, and you're hearing the cuckoos calling, they're African birds. You know, these are birds of the Congo rainforest. They're not really birds of the hill. They spend a, a, a real um, small amount of time up on the hill. It's uh, it's the rainforest, really, that they know. So, uh, and when they're there, they're sharing their home with uh, species like Western lowland gorilla, with bongo, but also corncrakes, because they go to the exact same places our corncrakes go to. Uh, a little bit more aerodynamic, I think, than a corncrake. Uh, always amazes me that a corncrake actually makes it to the Congo, but uh, but they do, and they share their, uh, their home with uh, cuckoos whilst they're there. So they're there till about January time, and then they start thinking about the return trip. But they don't just uh, do a U-turn and fly straight back to uh, Scotland. First of all, they go west, and they go to the uh, western rainforest, so the area, Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, that kind of area, that's where our cuckoos are heading. And what they're doing whilst they're there, it's thought that they're waiting uh, for the rains to hit. So these rains hit a, a particular time of year, at this time of year in, in late winter, early spring. And what they're doing is fattening up, fattening up for that return journey. Um, the first thing that they're going to have to do once they, they leave that area is cross the Sahara, and they do it in a one -er. That's a, a massive amount of energy is required uh, to do that, uh, flying all day, all night, all day, and all the next night uh, to get across the Sahara. And then they've got to travel across Europe. Obviously, they've got to fly the Med, depending on which route they'll take. They'll either go um, over Gibraltar and through Spain, or they'll go through Italy, um, up through Europe, across England, and then back into Scotland. And when they arrive on the breeding grounds in Scotland, uh, they've got to be in good enough condition to breed. So this staging post is incredibly important for them. Um, it's really important that they get enough energy to make that journey across the Sahara, across Europe, back to Scotland uh, within good enough condition to breed. So we'll talk a, a little bit about how important this is in just a second, but keep that in mind that this is probably the most important staging post for our uh, cuckoos during their whole migration period. And then uh, about mid-April, they arrive back on the breeding ground. So this is a picture taken in the Trossachs. Uh, and this is kind of the landscape that I associate cuckoos with, the kind of glens uh, uh, of Scotland, nice highland areas uh, with lots of meadow pipits, lots of uh, food for them as well to eat, uh, and lots of places for uh, cuckoos to sit and uh, do that classic song. They're here for such a short amount of time. So generally, um, uh, our cuckoos will arrive somewhere around the 15th of April, 20th of April, some going into May. Um, that's when, during May, that's when they'll have established their breeding territories. They'll be calling like absolute crazy. Great sound the first time you hear it. They're a real harbinger of spring. Uh, the 10,000th time you see it, it kind of goes through your head a little bit, especially uh, uh, during those long spring uh, days uh, where the cuckoos are calling sometimes into 10, 11 o'clock at night, especially on the in the Hebrides. I've had cuckoos calling. They really do go for it. So they'll call throughout um, May, they'll call into June, and then by July, most cuckoos are already thinking about going, and by August, they've all gone. The only birds that are still left are the um, young chicks, and most of them will have fledged by the end of August and, and definitely have gone by September. So they're here for a very short amount of time. It works out that it's about 15% of their time is spent in Scotland, uh, about 40% of their time is spent in, spent in the Congo, and the rest of the time is just spent traveling to and fro. So uh, yeah, a bird that is really on the move a lot of the time, and the only time that it's uh, uh, in any one place for a long time, it's the Congo rainforest, which is quite incredible when you think about it. Whoops. Uh, just go back. So all that information that I just relayed to you really comes from a piece of work that was done by the BTO. Uh, this was the BTO uh, uh, Cuckoo Tracking Project. Uh, they've been tracking and tagging cuckoos since 2011. So this involves uh, catching cuckoos and putting satellite trackers on them. 
and then they follow the movements of those birds uh, throughout their lives. Um, some of the journeys that these birds have made have been absolutely incredible. It shows the longevity and the tenacity of these birds doing multiple trips backwards and forwards. And when you look at that map and the loops, that's two birds, the yellow and the blue uh, represents um, two birds migration routes. That loop is 10,000 miles uh, and the birds will, will do that every year as if it's absolutely nothing. I mean, absolutely incredible. And crossing, you know, one of the most inhospitable places on the planet, the Sahara Desert, twice uh, to do it. It's it's an absolutely incredible uh, journey. And the fact that we know this information really comes uh, uh, from this tracking project. So it's a real testament to their work. They've got a fantastic website. Um, so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the cuckoos, they give them all individual names and regular updates. So you can find out exactly where the cuckoos are and what they've been doing. Uh, and there's a great animation on the map as well that allows you to play through um, the uh, recent uh, journeys of the cuckoos, where they've been moving through uh, uh, and what they've been up to. Then uh, there's a QR code at the bottom there. If you give that a scan, it'll take you to the website. So yeah, some really fantastic work from the BTO there. So our cuckoos have done the journey back to the back to Scotland. Let's pretend it's mid-April now. So they've just they've crossed the Sahara, they've flown up through Europe, and they've landed on the breeding grounds. Uh, let's say that's somewhere in the Trossachs. And what's the first thing that they want to do? Well, the first thing that they're probably want, going to want to do is feed. So it seems like a good time to talk about diet. And when it comes to cuckoos, they don't do anything uh, normal. Uh, you know, they're not feeding on berries. They're not feeding on uh, um, worms or anything like that. What they're feeding on is caterpillars, but not just any caterpillars. They're feeding on the really hairy uh, caterpillars that no other bird wants to touch and no other species wants to touch. That's what cuckoos are going for. Uh, so this is a classic example there of a cuckoo feeding on a nice hairy caterpillar. And the species that they're after, um, here's some species of moth for you, Stuart, to uh, uh, perk you up. Uh, uh, are the ones that produce the big hairy caterpillars. So top left, we've got the drinker. So the drinker moth is a, um, a summer flying species, but the caterpillars emerge um, uh, at the end of summer. They feed up as a caterpillar, they overwinter as a caterpillar, and then they feed up really quickly in the um, early spring. So by the time the cuckoos come, they, they're a decent size. Uh, so they're really important cuckoo food. If you go up onto the hills of Scotland, uh, around about May time, April, May time, the big hairy caterpillar that you see sat out on the grass stems, that's likely to be a drinker moth. And that's what the cuckoos are going for. Um, so they are a really important food uh, source. That's top left. Top right is our northern egger, another big hairy caterpillar um, uh, that cuckoos absolutely love. And then not so much in uh, Scotland, but down south, uh, garden tiger um, is a really important food source. So that's the caterpillars that you might know as woolly bears that um, were once so common across uh, big areas of uh, the UK in general and have declined horrendously across much of their range. Um, but they're a really important uh, uh, food source for cuckoos and also the ermine moths. That's a buff ermine on the, um, the bottom right as well. And one species that I did miss off, but I know is very important for cuckoos, is fox moth. So fox, uh, fox moths are, uh, it's another hairy caterpillar, as you can imagine, um, but uh, fox moths overwinter as a fully grown caterpillar. So in late winter, when, uh, it, yeah, in late winter, February, March time, when they, uh, are, um, when they emerge in April time, uh, they're fully grown. They're absolutely huge. Think about, you know, the length of your pinky finger and you won't be too far off. So for cuckoos, they're absolutely fantastic. And the cuckoos have got one major adaptation to deal with those hairy caterpillars. Um, what they do is they first, um, they batter them a little bit, tenderize them up on a stick and swallow them down. And of course, those hairs are going to irritate the inside, the stomach lining uh, of any bird, including the cuckoo. But the cuckoos have got very thick uh, lining in their stomach and it can actually shed away. And so what happens is those hairs get stuck in the lining of the stomach and then the cuckoo just regurgitates and coughs out that lining uh, and, uh, and and gets rid of the hairs that way. So it opens up a food resource that no other bird can really uh, um, take advantage of. So, you know, a whole new food resource for the cuckoos. The issue on that, though, of course, is that many of these moth species have declined horrendously. You know, the garden tiger moth has declined by 92% in the last 40 years. Um, and a lot of these other moth species have declined as well. So when it comes to what's important for cuckoos, um, we're not just thinking about, you know, their hosts and what they need from a habitat point of view. We're thinking about what food they require. And because it's quite specific, you know, they're not going to feed on anything else. Um, we have to be thinking about these kind of moth species. 
uh, and what they need as well as what the cuckoos need. So that's the first thing that the male cuckoos are doing or any cuckoo. When it arrives in Scotland, it's thinking about food and this is what it's feeding on. The next thing that it's thinking about is setting up uh, a breeding territory. Now, a breeding territory for a cuckoo isn't uh, really uh, related to the food resources for them. So they're not looking for areas of lots and lots of caterpillars, and that's you know where they're uh, going to set up their uh, territory because ultimately the females will travel to feed on those areas, uh, and you know they're not going to set up their nest there because they don't make a nest. Um, they're obligate brood parasites. Cuckoos cannot rear their own young. They don't have a brood patch. They can't incubate their eggs. They have no way of doing that. They are completely reliant on their host, these smaller birds that they lay their eggs into. So when it comes to setting up a territory, what the male cuckoo is thinking is, I want to be in an area with lots and lots of host species, lots and lots of little birds. And when it comes to Scotland, it's thinking meadow pipits. It wants an area with lots and lots of meadow pipits because that's what the female cuckoo is, is looking for. So that's what the male cuckoos are after as well. And hopefully this is going to work, but when they uh, found an area that they uh, think is good as a territory, then you know what they're going to do. They're going to signal that it's a good place. And that's where this call comes in. Hopefully you can hear that. Can I get some nods if you can hear that? No. No, I can't hear it, James. No, oh, okay. Well, you'll, you'll have to use your imagination, I'm afraid, uh, and imagine a cuckoo calling cuckoo. Uh, that cuckoo call is all about um, establishing themselves to the females. It's letting the females know that this is a good territory and I'm a good male. The deeper that cuckoo, the, the more persistent that cuckoo, if it goes on for a long period of time, you, that cuckoo's got a lot of stamina, it's got a lot of energy, and that means it's, it's a good male, it's a good territory, and the females want to be associated with it. Um, the cuckooing can go on and on and on. Those males really want to let those females know um, that you know they're a fit male and uh, uh, they've got a good territory. And you can see the effort that um, it takes. This is a, a picture of a calling male and you can see that uh, throat is really kind of bulged out as he's really giving everything behind it. There's a lot uh, of meaning behind that call as well. Cuckoos make a variety of calls. This is the most common one that um, uh, uh, you'll all be familiar with. But um, uh, the, the call, uh, apart from letting the females know that it's good territory, it's also a warning to, to other males as well. So that cuckoo, I'm going to have to do it myself, aren't I? So it's cuckoo. Cuckoo. And the time in between one cuckoo sound and the next one is precisely a cuckoo. So that pause is really important because that pause allows them to listen to hear if there's any other males calling around that area. And some work that's been done recording cuckoo calls has actually found that each male gives a completely individual call. And the males, once they've established their territories, they can recognize their neighbor's call. So they know the call of, the, of their male because they're uh, of their neighbors because they're all completely distinctive. And when researchers played the neighbor's call to a cuckoo, it didn't react that strongly. But when it played a stranger's cuckoo call to the male, it reacted very aggressively because this is a, a male that it doesn't know. It could be an interloper trying to take over its territory. So you almost get a, um, throughout the through the breeding season, which remember is only very short. These males get to know one another. They recognize those calls. They're listening to each other constantly as they're giving these calls and they recognize which ones are neighbors and which ones are interlopers. So for us, it's you know a very uh, repetitive call that's maybe for, for some people associated with a clock. But for cuckoos, there's a lot of meaning behind that uh, that call, uh, and a lot can be deduced uh, uh, from the individuals when they, when they hear it. So that's the, the male's call. Uh, let's go over to the females. So it's a shame you're not going to be able to hear this. Um, the females give a completely different call. So the females are smaller than the males, not by much. Uh, if you were to see them in flight, you would probably struggle uh, to see the difference between uh, a male and a female, but they are they are smaller. They're very cryptic, the females, so they don't cuckoo, um, uh, so you won't hear them give that call. The call they give is something called a bubbling call. Um, uh, it's If you've ever heard a green woodpecker give a call that's known as a yaffle, then it's very similar to that. A lot of people confuse, excuse me, female cuckoos call with a green woodpecker. 
but it's kind of like a, a rising, laughing, bubbling call. I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, but if you want to uh, Google it, then give it a Google. It's, it's very distinctive. Uh, you might have heard it yourself while you're walking on the hill uh, and just yeah, being completely unaware. When I was on call, actually, this spring, I was talking to the reserve manager and uh, uh, asking him if he'd heard any females. And he, uh, he said, no, I don't think I've ever heard a female call. And I played it on my phone. He said, I've never heard that. And I've lived here for 16 years, never heard a female call. That afternoon, he was out, heard a female call. And he's probably heard it all the time, thought it was an oyster catcher or a curlew or something else. Definitely not a green woodpecker on call. But uh, um, yeah, it's a very distinctive call. And once you get your ear into it uh, you and you're in an area with cuckoos, you'll probably hear it. They don't make it very often though. And it's a call that's, um, that's used really to kind of let the males know that they're there. As I said, they're very cryptic. So the males will often sit in a very obvious place on a, uh, on a high rock or at the very top of a tree or in a telegraph wire and they give their call. They want to be seen, you know, they want that call to echo as far as possible um, to attract as many females uh, in as possible. But the females are much more cryptic. Um, they, they don't want to be seen. Their job, as we'll find out, is really just about finding uh, bird's nests. So, you know, you don't want to be a really obvious species flying around cuckooing if you're trying to find bird's nests. Um, so, yeah, they're very cryptic. Uh, they'll give this bubble call largely to let the males know where they are. And when that happens, what you'll see is the male will fly down to where the female is and he'll start displaying. That normally involves more cuckooing, as you should imagine. Uh, but he'll also start head bobbing, tail fanning, and he'll start turning from side to side just to kind of show himself off. If a female likes what she sees, she'll take off. And the male will chase her and they'll go for a very long chasing flight. I've seen females and males disappear over the hill well away from their territory. They just completely disappear. Um, and really what the, the, the purpose of that is the female is getting the male to, uh, she, she's judging his fitness. You know, can he keep up with her? If he can keep up with her, then uh, they'll mate and she'll settle down in that territory and she'll start the process of uh, looking for bird's nests and the male will try and find as many females as possible. That cuckooing throughout the season He's desperately just trying to find uh, and attracting as many uh, females. That's that's what it's all about for him. So, and if you're lucky enough to see a female, this is often how they'll look. So this is a terrible picture that I managed to take on call of a female cuckoo doing what female cuckoos do best, which is lying very still, not doing very much and observing what's happening around them. So uh, generally, if they can, they'll do this in a tree, and you've got no chance of seeing them because they'll lie right along the branch and just be completely invisible. Um, I've often I've seen them as well do this on rocks. They'll hide themselves down flat on a rock, or they'll just peer over the top of a knoll, um, or in this instance, uh, yeah, on the top of a telegraph uh, pole. And they sit. They can sit there for hours. I've spent four hours watching a female cuckoo just watching other birds, uh, and they have to do this because, as we'll learn, they. Uh, um, what they have to do is is a bit of a miracle, to be honest, um, in order to uh, enable them to lay their eggs into other birds' nests. So this is, if you're lucky enough to see a female cuckoo, this is the kind of view that you get. So what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for their host species. So we'll, we'll talk now about the, what most people associate cuckoos with, which is laying their eggs in other birds' nests. So what I'm going to talk about now is purely from a Scottish perspective, um, because which species cuckoos parasitize depends on where they are. So if you were down in, say, Cambridgeshire, for example, cuckoos would really be focusing in on reed warblers. But in Scotland, for us, the species that they are mostly focused on is meadow pipits. Um, meadow pipits in the uplands, that's what uh, our cuckoos are really kind of uh, cued into. Other species that they'll use are dunnocks, so that's the bird in the top right, and they'll also use pied wagtails as well. Uh, but really, it's uh, it's uh, meadow pipits are the species that they're really focused in on. So that's why uh, cuckoos are associated uh, largely with upland sites. It's because the upland sites have got the meadow pipits and they've got the big hairy caterpillars, which the cuckoos like to feed on. So what kind of ideal territory for a cuckoo? So this is another uh, picture taken from the Isle of Col. And this was uh, a picture of a male's territory who was very successful. He had three females uh, in attendance in, um, uh, uh, on his territory. And the reason that it's so successful is up on the hill there on the top right of the picture, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, so in this area, it's just swarming in meadow pipits. There was a really high density uh, of meadow pipits in that area. So absolutely perfect uh, for the cuckoos. 
Uh, down here, we've got patches of scrub. So that's great for the females. They can hide in those patches of scrub. They can also hide on these rocks as well, um, hide themselves in any uh, nooks and crannies and peering over and trying to find out where the meadow pipit nests are and what stage they're at. And you might just be able to see here as well as a telegraph line running through. So that's perfect for the male. He's got a nice perch that he can sit on, excuse me, cuckoo to his heart con heart's content and attracting those females. And the other thing that's great about this site is um, those rocks just reverberate that cuckoo. So it made him sound like he was an absolute monster because the echoes deafening, especially at four o'clock in the morning when you were trying to trap him. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he had a set of pipes on him. And what they're looking for in those areas is this. So this is a meadow pipit nest. Now, interestingly, this picture was taken at Coromony just after the fire. So this was a, a, a pair of birds that had moved back in after the fire had gone through and uh, and started a new nest. They, um, uh, laid up a clutch of, uh, of eggs. But this is what the female cuckoo's looking for. She's looking for that clutch of eggs and she's looking at it at a very, for a very spe specific time period. She can't lay her eggs, obviously, uh, lay her egg into a nest that doesn't have any eggs in it. So it's got to have at least uh, one egg in it, preferably two. And what the female will do is one egg out and lay one egg in. And she's also got to be very critical about um, when she lays it, um, from a point of view of incubation. If incubation's already started, then it's, it's too late. She needs to lay that egg either just as incubation has started for the meadow pipits or before, because if the chicks hatch before the cuckoo, it makes it much more difficult for the cuckoo to do its job, which we'll talk about next, which is the arms race. So what we're gonna talk about now is the arms race that's going on between not America and China, but cuckoos and meadow pipits. So I mentioned that uh, cuckoos will parasitize other species in, uh, in Scotland, but the one that's kind of most advanced is uh, the arms race that's happening be between cuckoos and meadow pipits. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that now. So when it comes to the arms race, what are we talking about? What's the, uh, what weapons does each side have? Let's cover the meadow pipit first. So meadow pipits have been dealing with cuckoos for tens of thousands of years. This is a game that's been going on for a very long time and no species has won it yet. Um, meadow pipits are probably, made, they're always one step ahead, I guess they have to be, um, but the cuckoo is close on its heels. So what, what tools and weapons does a meadow pipit have to dodge the crafty cuckoo? Well, first of all, it's a very cryptic nesting species and it's very wary around its nest. If you've ever spent any time watching meadow pipits or maybe trying to find a meadow pipit nest, it's very difficult. For a species that is very common uh, and nests in you know, quite high densities, uh, they don't like anyone being around their nests. You, know, you can be 100 meters uh, from a meadow pipit's nest. It can have a big load of flies in its beak ready to give its chicks and it'll just keep alarm calling at you until you go away. It doesn't want you anywhere near its nest. So, and those nests are very well hidden. Uh, you can go in and look for a meadow pipit nest, um, you know, a couple of times and be absolutely sure where it's gone in uh, and it will give you the slip. They're very good at looking like they've gone straight into the nest, but actually they've, you know, dropped down or done a long glide into dead ground where you can't see them. Or maybe they've dropped and done a little walk in. Um, yeah, they're very cryptic when it comes to their nest. So that's that's the main thing that uh, that's one of the first things that is um, that's their, their greatest ally. Their nests are difficult to find even for cuckoos. They also nest in high densities and loose colonies. If you walk into an area with meadow pipits, they'll start alarming very quickly and that'll set off their neighbors, which will set off their neighbors and so on and so on. So you get this kind of ripple effect. You get the same if you walk into an area where waders nest, you know, the one bird starts alarm calling, it sets the whole colony off. And that's the same with uh, meadow pipits as well. They're also very good at recognizing their own eggs. If you were to take a egg of a meadow pipit out, and put in an egg of a, another species uh, of a similar size, but a different color, say a white egg, meadow pipit uh, eggs are that kind of greeny mottled brown color. Uh, they would either try and remove that egg or they would just abandon the clutch. And that's completely driven by the arms race that's going on with cuckoos. So meadow pipits are getting more and more complex eggs that they recognize as their own. And cuckoos are trying to match that. It's, it's constantly like, uh, uh, a forger trying to uh, forge a great artwork, you know, you can, or, or banknotes, I guess, would be a better example. You know, you can make banknotes become 
more and more and more uh, experience it for cuckoos have been doing this for a very long time if you were to see a cuckoo egg in a dunnock nest it doesn't look anything like a uh, a dunnock's egg a cuckoo's egg doesn't look anything like a dunnock's egg and a dunnock can't tell the difference between them it hasn't evolved that um that way of discriminating yet and that's that's a good example of the fact that cuckoos and dunnocks probably haven't pl been playing this game for very long although still probably for thousands of years but not as long as meadow pipits have and, and cuckoos the other thing about a meadow pipit and this is a bit of a personal observation is a meadow pipit knows a cuckoo when it sees one, um, and it knows what it's up to. Uh, when a cuckoo lands in an area, meadow pipits give them hell right from the beginning. You know, they'll um, they'll mob the bird, they'll alarm call. I've seen cuckoos on the ground looking for meadow pipit nests, and when they found it, meadow pipits on the back of the cuckoo trying to pull it, the feathers out the back of the head. They know that it's a cuckoo. They're not fooled that it's a sparrowhawk. Um, and they're going to yeah, give it hell until it gets out of their territory. Uh, and it's not uncommon to see a cuckoo flying across a moorland with a trail of meadow pipits uh, following behind it. So what does the cuckoo do against all this? Well, it does look similar to a sparrowhawk. Uh, and whilst I've never seen meadow pipits scattering in the wake of cuckoos, potentially there are novel birds out there or very wary birds that that does work for. Um, and just kind of gives them the slip. But I would imagine that's more likely to work for uh, species that aren't as familiar with uh, with cuckoos. So maybe going back to the dunnocks, it's more successful with them. They've got an incredible ability to watch birds back to nests and determine laying dates. So as I said, the female cuckoo, it, what she needs is a clutch of meadow pipit uh, uh, eggs that hasn't started incubation yet. So what she's often doing is she's just watching an area, watching the meadow pipits and trying to determine what stage they're at. So uh, ideally she's finding them just as they're finishing um, making their nests so she can go in and lay her egg once they've got a couple of uh, uh, eggs laid in. Now bearing in mind a meadow pipit lays an egg every day. The average clutch size is around five. So after five days, she's gonna start incubating and she's ready to incubate. So she's got a very narrow window when the cuckoo can go in, remove an egg and lay her own egg uh, in, into that nest. Now cuckoos lay an egg every two days. So she, uh, with it, within those two days, she's got to find a nest that's ready and able to take uh, 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 her, her, her egg, which it, you know is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. There's lots of uh, documented cases of uh, female cuckoos seemingly getting frustrated and destroying meadow pipit nests. Uh, and the thought behind that is it forces them to then relay. And so the female then has a, a, a potential nest that she can again lay into. But generally what she's doing is she's just watching birds, finding out what stage they're at. She's then looking for those nests, trying to find them, uh, and then building up a mental map of which nests are at which stage and where she can lay. Now, the logistics behind that are mind boggling. It, you know, For me to find a single meadow pipit nest is pretty tricky, but she's got to do it multiple times for a season and she's got a time period to do it on as well it's incredible the amount of uh, reasoning power that goes on in a, a, a female cuckoo's mind and i think the intelligence of cuckoos is something we don't really fully uh, understand uh, but clearly they've got some real uh, problem solving ability that would be required to, to do what they do the other thing that they do uh, which is quite interesting is they can incubate the egg internally before laying so most birds lay an egg every day or every other day. So for a cuckoo to do it every two days uh, is quite strange. But what's actually happening is she's giving her, her um, chick at this stage, it's just a group of cells, a little bit of a head start. Uh, and it's been shown that when a cuckoo lays its egg, it's at a, a further stage of development than what a meadow pipit's egg would be at that stage. You know, a meadow pipit's egg hasn't started developing at all, but a cuckoo egg has started developing because it's had that opportunity inside the female to just start that development. And that just gives it that head start because what's really important is the cuckoo chick hatches before the uh, host chicks do. Uh, it's much easier for it to push out the eggs or uh, the eggs of a, a host species rather than the chicks. So that head start is really crucial. And the final thing that the cuckoo does is it's it's very good at producing an egg that matches the host. Now, not all the time. If it's not required, for example, uh, in the case of the dunnock but generally a cuckoo egg is gonna uh, match the host species uh, pretty well. And here's an example of that here. So this is a meadow pipit clutch. 
so that you can see the egg, the larger, paler egg on the left-hand side, that's a cuckoo egg, and the other four eggs, that's of a meadow pipit. Now, it's not a fa that's not a fantastic match, to be perfectly honest. I've seen better than that. But you can see <clears throat> um, that from a size point of view, remember, this is a bird that's much bigger than meadow pipits, actually lays quite a small egg in comparison to the bird size, but couldn't lay it any bigger because the meadow pipit A would, would notice and B wouldn't be able to incubate it properly. So it's, it's constrained from the size of the egg by the size of the host species. Uh, and also that mottling, with a bit more mottling, that would be a very good match for the meadow pipit. Whether this was a successful one and the meadow pipit uh, accepted it or not, I, I'm not sure. But uh, if the bird doesn't accept it, it will either try and remove it or more likely abandon it. But if it starts incubating it, it's doomed. Because this is what happens. So the cuckoo chick will inevitably hatch out first. And the reason for that is because it's had that little head start. So it gets ahead of its um, uh, foster siblings. Um, it will first uh, require a bit of a feed and a bit of a rest because the whole uh, process of hatching from an egg is absolutely exhausting. So they'll need a few hours first. But then they'll uh, once they've had a few hours and a bit of food to get their energy levels up, they'll start doing what cuckoos do best, and that's getting rid of the competition. This is really important uh, for cuckoo chicks because they need all the food that these parent birds are going to be bringing in. They can't share it with any of their siblings. So the uh, cuckoo chick has really well-developed um, uh, legs and claws, and it's got very well-developed uh, uh, wings. Uh, and But at this stage, the wing bones are um, uh, only used really for balancing the egg on the uh, the chick's back to be pushed out of the nest. There's a little divot as well on its back, so which allows the egg to sit on um, uh, sit on its back. And essentially what the chick is doing, it's completely blind at this stage. It can't see anything. It's just feeling around the nest for, for anything else that's in there. So it wouldn't matter if it was eggs or ball bearings or marbles. It can't tell the difference. All it knows is the only thing in that nest. So it's feeling around. When it feels an egg, it's gonna try and manipulate it in a way that it's the egg is on its back. And it's then going to push its legs up to the edge of the nest and then toss that egg out. Now, you may be wondering, what on earth is the parent bird doing when this is happening? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Uh, if, As I said, if the adult bird begins incubation, then the cuckoo's won. There, there isn't any discrimination from the, from the adult, uh, from the host birds that, you know, they're acting very abnormally or it's kicking my eggs out. You know, that reasoning isn't there. Um, in fact, there's... Uh, uh, a bit of film footage that was taken uh, a few years ago now on one of the BBC One Wildlife documentaries where the bird actually, the host bird actually uh, moves out of the way to allow the cuckoo to, to kick the eggs uh, out of the nest. So yeah, there's there's no helping the, the host birds at this stage. And the, the cuckoo chick will continue doing this until all the eggs are removed. You can also do it for chicks as well. So it will kick out chicks if it hasn't uh, managed to hatch out first. But it will keep doing this for a period of about two days. And then after that, that instinct is lost. Uh, and then any other chicks, uh, if there's chicks still in the nest after this, then, you know, that ability to kind of remove them from the nest is lost. And so it will then have to compete alongside those uh, foster siblings. Now, generally what happens is the cuckoo is just so much bigger than its foster siblings. It outcompetes them uh, after death. But uh, in most cases, the cuckoo is successful and manages to get the eggs and chicks out and then has the nest to itself. And then what it's all about then is making the uh, uh, host birds, its foster parents, give it as much food as possible. So the call of a cuckoo chick is equivalent to more than the calls of all it, um, its foster siblings put together. So if you had five meadow pipit chicks calling for food, the cuckoo chick matches that and beats it with its call. It's an incredibly loud call, and it's got an incredibly uh, big red gate that the parents just find irresistible and just keep churning food into that chick. And they have to because the, the uh, cuckoo chick needs to grow at a phenomenal rate. And if they're successful, this is what you see. So this is a cuckoo chick that's successfully taken over the nest of a meadow pipit. As you can see, it completely fills the nest of the meadow pipit uh, and this chick is telling me to to get lost. So it's it's giving a bit of a gate. The picture is perfect because it shows you that big red gate of the cuckoo that the adult birds just find absolutely irresistible and just keep firing protein in the form of insects into the chick. 
and we even get to this stage. So this is a classic uh, picture. You see lots of these pictures of a recently fledged cuckoo chick that is still demanding food from its adults. And even at this stage where the adult birds, the foster parents are sitting on the back of the chick and feeding it, you know, that, that instinct to just keep uh, piling food into those chicks is so strong, you know, they'll keep doing that. Uh, uh, and it, you know, the game is completely lost at this point. A uh, couple of uh, bits to kind of cover here of just how um, damaging this is to the, the foster birds, because you might think, oh, well, you know, they raise a, a, a cuckoo chick and then they go on to raise their own brood. And, you know, that's that. But the cuckoo chick requires not only the entire food resource for those five chicks or one brood that um, it, it destroyed in order to, uh, to take over that nest, but also the next brood as well. So generally, meadow, pip meadow pipits will have two broods a year, but any um, foster, any birds that uh, end up fostering a cuckoo are parasitized by cuckoos. Uh, they don't have the energy resources to uh, uh, raise a second brood. That, that cuckoo chick, once it's fledged, keeps demanding food. So that opportunity to raise another brood is completely gone. And in fact, the, the birds themselves are in poorer condition once they've raised a cuckoo chick than birds that have just raised uh, meadow pipits, their own chicks. So it's incredibly damaging for the birds themselves to raise these chicks, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you think that the majority of meadow pipits might only get one breeding season, if you only have one breeding season, because they're a very short-lived bird, uh, and that breeding season is taken over by, a, uh, your nest is taken over by a cuckoo, it's a complete disaster because you might not get the opportunity to breed again, especially when you're going to be in poor condition and you have to migrate uh, uh, yourself because meadow pipits are migratory species as well. So yeah, cuckoos, you've got to love them, uh, but not if you're a meadow pipit because yeah, it's a, it, it's the last thing you want to happen if you're a meadow pipit is having a, a cuckoo chick in your nest. Okay, so that's a little bit about the biology and ecology of cuckoos. I hope you're all fans of cuckoos after that. Uh, You've got to love the ones that, yeah, really uh, test your ethics, I think, uh, especially when it comes to birds. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about how cuckoos are doing. So from a world perspective, um, the cuckoo, the common cuckoo, is rated, uh, is um, has a red listing on the IUCN uh, red list as least concern. So from a world range point of view, cuckoos are doing pretty well. Uh, they've got a really wide range um, across the whole of Asia and Europe, so you'll find uh, our species of cuckoo from obviously the UK and across Europe, right the way across Asia. So yeah, they're, they're, they're doing pretty well from a range point of view. But when we look at how cuckoos are doing from a UK point of view, they're not doing well at all. And on the birds of conservation concern, they're now a red listed species. And the reason they're a red listed species is because of the declines that we've seen. So cuckoos in the UK since the 1980s have declined by 65%. And the biggest declines, as we see uh, uh, on the uh, this BTO map here, are in the south uh, east of England. Those the declines there have been absolutely uh, horrific. So if you look at the map that I've just brought up on the right hand side, uh, the deeper the red, the bigger the uh, the uh, deeper the blue, the bigger the increases. So if we look at it across um, from a, um, a UK perspective, the biggest declines have been in England. There's been big declines in Wales, but over the last 10 years, those declines have now stabilised. But in Scotland, uh, we've actually seen increases in Scotland, uh, increases in cuckoos, particularly in the northwest. So that's that's always quite nice to talk about the fact that we've actually got increases uh, in uh, in Scotland with cuckoos. Now, why that's happening, why we've seen those declines isn't really known, but we can have a punt on some of the things that we think are probably causing it. The big one is something that's affecting all species, especially farmland birds, and that's homogenous landscapes. What we mean by that is landscapes that are the same, whether you're in East Anglia or East Lothian. You know, these big areas of arable, there's no hedgerows, woodland is very small, or it's of non-native uh, conifers. You know, uh, landscapes that just make it really difficult for species uh, to thrive in, not just, um, you know, the, the bird species that our cuckoos will be uh, parasitizing, but also the moths as well. The reason that our moths have declined by such a, a massive amount as well is habitat loss. It's homogenous landscapes. It's the same thing that's driving our cuckoos. So that's uh, that links to the loss of key lepidoptera prey. You know, as I said before, we've seen massive declines in some of the most important cuckoo species. Garden tiger, 92%. Um, in the last 40 years, uh, same for other species as well. So, 
you know, the, the species that they rely on are just disappearing. We're also seeing declines in um, farmland birds and, and, and host species. Meadow pipits have gone through big declines in a lot of areas of the UK. If we're seeing declines in the hosts and we're seeing declines in the food, we're going to see declines in cuckoos as well. And also climate change. When it comes to climate change, interestingly, uh, we can be a bit more specific because often when we say climate change, we can be a bit kind of up there and not entirely sure how climate change will affect species. But a paper that was published just recently by the BTO um, looked at that key uh, wind, um, staging area that I mentioned in West Africa. And <clears throat> what they found was that the, the return dates for cuckoos haven't really changed in the last 100 years. You know, cuckoos have always come back around the, uh, the middle of April, where what we're seeing with climate change is spring is starting to become earlier and earlier. And we're seeing with a lot of migrants, they're beginning to return earlier and earlier. And we're seeing, uh, you know, the changes in spring happening earlier. So we're seeing you know, caterpillars, food resources uh, starting to uh, um, uh, emerge earlier. And, you know, our bird species are starting to respond to that. But cuckoos don't seem to be doing that. And it could be that um, this key staging area in West Africa, the, the timing of those rains hasn't changed. And because the cuckoos are so dependent on those rains to give them the food resources to make that return journey, they cannot adapt to the change uh, in that spring weather coming forward. Because if the rains don't change in Africa, they don't have the food resources uh, you know, to make that um, uh, move north. So they're kind of really stuck uh, where they are. If there's, if there's no change in what's happening in Africa, it doesn't matter if the springs are moving forward in the UK, they can't respond to that because they won't have the food resources to get back earlier. So there's a potential for the cuckoos to become out of sync with their host and prey species. Uh, and so that could potentially be leading to some declines. If you'd like to read that paper in uh, some more detail, uh, you can give that QR code a scan there and that will take you straight to that BTO paper. Really interesting read. Okay, uh, before I briefly talk about uh, a little bit about coal and what happened out there, uh, I always like to talk a little bit about where you can see the species that I talk about. So where can you see cuckoos? Well, from a local point of view, for you guys in Stirling and Clackmanager, Sheriff Muir is a really good spot for that. If you uh, if you take the road that goes through Sheriff Muir uh, uh, and you're in the right time, so May, go on a nice day in May, uh, look on the uh, telegraph wires and you've got a good chance of uh, seeing a cuckoo. And if you don't see them, just take a, a, a slow walk and I'm sure you'll hear cuckoos. They'll, they'll be there pretty quickly. If you're struggling there, then head to the Trossachs. Uh, a little shout out for RSPB in the Snade. All around in the Snade and Loch Katrin uh, is absolutely moving in cuckoos. So if you, uh, this year particularly, this year was absolutely fantastic for cuckoos across Scotland, but particularly uh, in, in these hotspots. So yeah, have a look up there in uh, late April, early May, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. And then if you want to go a bit further afield, anywhere in Argyll, in the Inner Hebrides, uh, uh, you're going to get cuckoos, particularly on coal. So I'm just going to spend the last 10 or so minutes uh, telling you a little bit about coal and a little bit of work that I did out there um, uh, just recently in spring of this year. So if you are unfamiliar where coal is, it's here. It's uh, off the west coast of Scotland. It's very close to Mull and its neighbouring island is Tyree. So a lot of people have heard of Tyree or been to Tyree and they don't go to coal, which is just a crime. Or maybe actually that's a good thing uh, because coal's nice and quiet. Uh, and yeah, there's lots of uh, cuckoos and things to see and you get it to yourself. Uh, a little zoom in on coal itself. Uh, you ask the locals of coal to describe it and they'll always say it looks like a fish. So here's the island of coal that looks like a fish. So the head of the fish is up to the uh, northeast and the tail of the fish is in the southwest. Uh, the yellow patches on this map uh, denote uh, dunes. So there's some absolutely huge dunes and some fantastic dune grasslands on coal. And then largely through the interior, hopefully you can see my mouse, but the interior of coal is moorland wet bogland, which is pretty inhospitable and difficult to get around, but great if you're a diver. Uh, as in a red-throated diver, um, because there's loads of places to breed and great for uh, moorland species like hen harriers, meadow pipits, and cuckoos. So I have been going to coal for a long time. I first went in 2013 as part of a, a, a joint partnership between um, RSPB and Bug Life. And we were there not for cuckoos, 
But for this critter here, this is a short-necked oil beetle, Milo brevicollis, at the time. It was known from only two sites in the UK, uh, the island of Col, and a site down in Devon. Uh, thanks to Species on the Edge, it's now found all over the place um, because we've actually gone out and started looking in lots of more places. But at the time, it was only found in two spots. And what we wanted to do on call was search the whole island and get an idea of how it was doing and, and where it was found across the whole of the island. So that's what we were there to do, which involved a lot of staring at grass, trying to find beetles, uh, and doing lots of data work, hard work uh, in the sunshine and also yeah, trying to avoid the beaches, which on call are just stunning. So uh, yeah, uh, not a bad uh, four days to spend. But whilst we're there, I was already noticing that there was a lot of cuckoos everywhere that you went, if there was a telegraph wire particularly, but really anywhere you were hearing cuckoos and seemingly in pretty high densities. And so from 10 years ago, that kind of germ has been going around in the back of my head that if I was ever going to do anything on cuckoos, Hull would be the place to do it just because it seemed to have really high densities. And luckily, if you work for the RSPB, you get a sabbatical. So every five years, RSPB staff are entitled to a four-week sabbatical where you're required to go out and work on a conservation project uh, of your choosing um, as long as it's uh, forwarding, uh, you know, doing something for conservation, then it's really up to you. I managed to spend my first two weeks in Romania in 2019 working on the species there, which is the Danube Clouded Yellow, which is... Europe's um, most endangered endemic butterfly. So that was that was very nice. And then I would planned to spend the next two weeks on coal uh, doing cuckoo work in 2020. But you can imagine that didn't happen. So fast forward uh, a few years of delay. And in 2023, in May, I finally managed to get out and finish my sabbatical looking at cuckoos on coal. And the sabbatical had three main aims. I wanted to carry out a survey across the RSPB reserve to find out uh, how they were doing, where they were found, and how good was the reserve for cuckoos. I wanted to try and work out uh, male territory sizes, if possible, and also the densities. Are they in such high densities as I'd originally thought? And then try and work establish that territory size through ringing. Now, the third and final one was a bit of a stretch, to be perfectly honest. In only two weeks, to do that kind of uh, work is a bit of a push. Uh, but it gives them a good opportunity to return. So uh, once I've kind of established my uh, aims of the sabbatical, it was a short trip to Oban. And if you're in Oban, seafood and beer has got to be done, and then you're off to Col. So the island of Col, uh, from an RSPB point of view, this is the reserve. So it's quite a substantial reserve. Um, I, if you're looking at the, it there on the map, if you look at the bottom part of uh, the reserve, this is uh, quite... Um, moorlandy upland low uh, uh, um what's the word grassland essentially i forgot the word semi-improved grassland there we go um which is great for meadow pipits and cuckoos and then uh uh towards the west of the reserve is more june grassland which um the cuckoos aren't really found in but uh fantastic reserve this is reserve building itself so if you visit this is what you'll see and with any look, these are the kind of species that you'll see, as well as uh, the, the cuckoos. So you've got corncrake, white-tailed eagle, great place for seeing hen harriers, waders coming out of the ears, and also the only place in Scotland where you're going to see sand lizards after some were introduced in the 1970s. So the survey itself, um, essentially the survey requires you to uh, divide your area up into one kilometre squares. So the, um, the areas that uh, looked fairly good for cuckoos or had the potential to have cuckoos on reserve uh, comprised 12 one kilometer squares. So this is what you can see on the map here. And the idea is that you stand in the middle of that square or as close to it as possible and you play cuckoo calls in each of the four compass directions for uh, a minute each. And then you wait 15 minutes to see uh, if any birds respond. And then you record any males that respond uh, within that square. And the results of that were that there was only three squares where cuckoos weren't found and cuckoos were found in all other uh, areas. So a really good spot for cuckoos uh, uh, across that southern bit of the reserve. After that, I wanted to do a bit of ad hoc recording of birds. So what this map shows here is all the red dots are re uh, records of male cuckoos and all the green dots are records of female cuckoos. So this bit of work took me off reserve. So I was kind of covering... Uh, the south uh, um, west part of the island, um, this kind of circular route that goes through the main village of Arnagawa down to the reserve and then up and back around again. And when it came to recording males, 
what I would do is the males have these favored singing spots, which I took as the center of the territory. So if I saw a male singing in the same spot for three consecutive days, then I would take that as a territory and it would get a red dot. So this is what you're seeing when you look at those red dots. The green dots, these were just uh, females that I just uh, recorded as I was kind of going about my, my survey business. But each of these red dots represents a male that I've seen calling in the same spot for at least three, uh, for three consecutive days or over three days, not, not necessarily consecutive. Now, what's interesting about this is once you start putting buffers over it, you can see that they're actually quite evenly spaced out. So these buffers are 400 meters. So um, uh, some of these are really well spaced out, particularly down in the south. Um, something interesting was happening in the north, and I'll talk about a little bit about that in a second. But the birds are really um, uh, sticking to that 400 meters, which is quite interesting. Puku territories are really quite difficult to work out. And the reason for that is quite often the areas that they're defending are just the areas where the host birds are and they're flying somewhere else to feed. So if you were down in Cambridgeshire uh, around the reed beds, the cuckoos would be parasitizing reed warblers, but then they might be flying three, four miles away to be feeding somewhere else on big hairy caterpillars that they're looking for that they can't find in the reed beds. But in Scotland, and this is this is just my kind of personal thought, I think the breeding area, the, the areas where the, the birds are, the breeding areas and the feeding areas are the exact same place. They can find these big hairy caterpillars in the areas where the meadow pipits are. And in fact, I saw that on a number of occasions where cuckoos would be calling. They would stop calling, drop down, find a caterpillar, bring it up, feed on it and then start calling again. And so these territories, are, I think, are much more discreet. So any work that I've done trying to find out the average territory size of a cuckoo is normally around a kilometre. Um, and on call, they seem to be every 400 metres. Now, whether this is the same across all of the Scottish Highlands or all uh, Scottish Islands, or whether it's um, uh, uh, restricted to just call or even just this particular year, I don't know. This is kind of just the uh, uh, start of it. But at least at the moment, it seems that on call, uh, they're nesting in higher densities or their, their territories are in higher densities than potentially elsewhere. So the next thing that I wanted to do was a bit of trapping. And the way that you trap cuckoos is first you need a decoy. This is Chloe. Um, she's a 3D printed model of a cuckoo that has had a pretty dodgy paint job. Um, I'm no artist, but I did my best. Um, uh, you use that decoy and a call to attract the males in and then use a mist net um, to, uh, to trap the birds. And then you can uh, extract them from the mist net and put a coloring on them. Yeah on them so uh, this is uh, the setup in the field so hopefully you can see chloe with a uh, speaker underneath uh, just off of the center of the picture there so she's doing her business the the call is playing away uh, i've actually got a perch trap up there as well which you might be able to see on the left hand side so that's just a perch for the cuckoo that when it sits on it uh, a net comes up and catches it and will hopefully not be uh, a mist net uh, that runs along the right hand side that is designed to catch any cuckoos that are flying in and if you're lucky, uh, you catch your cuckoo. So this was a female cuckoo that was caught. Uh, and if you look on the right-hand side, the reason that I put this picture up is what's interesting here is she's got the adult plumage, but a few juvenile feathers as well, which meant that um, this bird was just a year old. She was a chick last year. She's flown to Africa, and then she's back uh, parasitizing nests uh, in Scotland, which is incredible, the fact that she's uh, managed to do that return journey and is already parasitizing nests when she's just a year, uh, a year old. Uh, you know, really incredible birds. Oh, I've just got one other thing to say. And the, the reason that I was doing this, if I just quickly go back, am I going to be able to go back? Yeah, to just quickly to just to go up to the two points at the, the top of the map that are very close together here. So one of the things that I wanted to do with the trapping was to find out if those two dots were um, actually different males or whether they were the same male. And in fact, through um, trapping and ringing, I worked out that they were, uh, two different males. So even within this, where most of the other birds are uh, very well spaced out, 400 meters, doesn't always work that way. And those two birds were actually uh, much closer together. And just to finish off, the final thing that I wanted to do while I was on call uh, was to find a cuckoo chicken a nest. It's something that I've always wanted to do since I was a, a kid, really, and saw you know that first image of a, a big cuckoo chick sat in a nest. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do it anywhere, this is the time to do it. So I'd done all my survey work. I had two days left and I thought I'm gonna devote the next two days to just looking for meadow pipit nests and trying to find uh, a cuckoo chip. Uh, and on the second to last day, I 
had, I was driving along and saw a meadow pipit with a big bunch of flies in its its beak. And down it went in, uh, into a bit of dead ground. I couldn't see where it went, but I heard this call um, of a chick. And I thought that is either a big brood of meadow pipits or it's a cuckoo chick. So I watched it go in and then I walked in to try and find the nest and couldn't find it. Came back, watched the bird go in again, walked in to find the nest and couldn't find it. And I have a rule that if I can't find a nest after three times of looking, then that's it. It's, I, I don't go in again. And the reason for that is I'm always worried that I'm disturbing the birds too much or worst case scenario, you end up standing on the nest because every time you go in, doesn't matter how careful you are, there's always that risk. So I thought to myself, I've been in twice. If I go in again the third time, I can't find it, that's it. And I thought there's this huge area of dead ground. What I need is a camera. I need a little CCTV camera that can sit in that dead ground and record where the bird's going. And of course, we all have one. It's called a mobile phone. Hopefully this will work. So this was the phone put in the dead ground. Uh, I'm sat somewhere over here, uh, over to the left. You can't see me because of that, that brow of the hill. And the bird, hopefully you can see it uh, just to put the top. It's about to fly in to uh, and sit on a bit of pepper. There it goes. And it's about to drop into the nest. And there was the bit of dead ground that I just couldn't see. The chick, uh, uh, the bird was going in to feed the chick and away it went. So I let it do this a couple of times, went in, retrieved the mobile phone, watched this video back, worked out ugh, that's where the nest is and uh, was rewarded with a cuckoo chick, which was just absolutely fantastic. This cuckoo chick is probably somewhere around between 10 and 14 days old, something like that. So it's still got a ways to go. Uh, but these uh, meadow pipits were firing food into this thing uh, and just a fantastic end to uh, a sabbatical, being able to not only find it, but it was big enough to ring. So with any luck, when I go back next spring and do a bit more cuckoo work, this uh, this little guy might be back on call as well. Matt, my talk. thank you very much for listening. Oh, th thank you, James. That was absolutely fantastic. I hope you can all hear me there. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sorry, Stuart. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I had a, I had a wee hiccup but, uh, during it when the, I was trying to sort out the, see if we could get the sound of the cuckoo and I managed to turn off my own, my own sound instead. But that, that was actually amazing. I, I didn't know that about the female calls at all. Um, I, I now, I need to go away and listen to a female cuckoo call to work out if I've actually heard one and I bet I have too, but I just did not know that at all, um, that they had different calls. I hadn't thought about it. I think one of the other amazing things that I hadn't thought about until just listening to call there is just how short they're with us for. And I think I was thinking, well, I've seen cuckoos later in the year, but of course what I've been seeing is the youngsters. So the adults that have come in, it's amazing how quick to think they are. They're just in, in those eggs in the nest and they're away again. Um, I think that's ab absolutely amazing. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that before. Um, as I say, mostly because I thought, oh, I've seen young ones about, but I thought, yeah, of course, why would the adults hang around? You know, they're not bringing up the young. They don't need to hang about. Um, so that absolutely fantastic. Actually, when you, when you say about it, it just shows how much and how international conservation of species like the cuckoos has to be, how important things like the staging post is uh, for them to make that journey back up where they spend the other half of their life cycle. But even when they get here to the UK, having those uh, having those moths there to for them to feed on and having the right species and them to be at the right state and the right numbers. Actually, with garden tiger is one that I, I do a lot of moth trapping, as many of you know, and it's one of the species I've noticed a decline even in the relatively short time I've moth trapped. And I was actually on call um, in the latter part of this summer there. And uh, yes, I, I that was one of the best places I've ever seen garden tigers. So 20 and 30 in a trap on the macker. I do recommend visit to call. If you're wanting a wildlife holiday, go to call and have a look around call. It's absolutely amazing. Into the macker, into some of the hills and some of the areas around about amazing place but yes it's amazing and also the you know the meadow pipits and how important they are and i actually didn't know that they wouldn't likely have another brood i didn't know that i often thought oh, i bet they just go i didn't know it just shows how much they need to do but how important it is i guess that we make sure we have lots of meadow pipits about um 
So we've got a couple of a couple of questions um, that have come in during the talk, and I think there's a few more appearing in the chat as well. So the first one is, how long do cuckoos live for? Uh, so the longevity record for a cuckoo is almost seven years, I think. Uh, but I, I think the average is probably between two and four years. So yeah, they're not a long-lived species. And as you'd imagine, you know, they... There's a lot of trials and tribulations over the journey from uh, Scotland back to the Congo uh, and back again. And I would imagine that most birds uh, succumb to uh, uh, on the migration. You know, it's a massive resource required uh, to undertake that 10,000 mile journey. And that's probably where a lot of birds are lost. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's I, 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 I kind of thought it would be longer thinking about some other things. That's, but I guess when you see that about that journey, it is some trip and yeah. over some terrain as well. Um, just what else do I have? Do, do the meal cuckoos always go back to the same place? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah, it's thought so. So there is movement. Um but uh, from memory, the tracking work that when they were doing tracking work in round lock capturing, which was the bit that I kind of followed most closely, the males were coming back to, to the, the same area. Yeah. So that'll be really interesting. I'm hoping to go back to call uh, this, well, this coming spring and see if I can catch some of the, the males. So I run seven males uh, this year. So it'd be interesting to see if I can recapture some of those this year. Oh, well, they well, for We'll definitely need to get uh, an update from you for that. That would be fascinating to see if you get some of the same ones again. Um, another question here is, how how many nests do they lay eggs in? Or I guess that's the same as how many eggs do they lay as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So back in the early part of the 20th century, there was a guy called Chance who was completely obsessed with cuckoos. And he had uh, a... He had an area that he manipulated the meadow pipit nest, i.e. he removed the, the eggs of the meadow pipits to make it so it was an absolute nirvana for cuckoos. And his particular cuckoo, I think the record for that was over 20 eggs that it laid. So they can lay a phenomenal amount of eggs if the, if the conditions are right, much more than they'd ever lay themselves. But I think <clears throat> on average, a female cuckoo is going to be laying somewhere between seven to 10 eggs, something like that, I would say. But that's be that's amazing. <laughs> so many. I'm just reading new questions. I've come in at the same time and must have to my side. So on the route south, um, when they're crossing the Sahara, do they have a, a similar kind of refueling stop as they're making a, a trip south, or is that more in a one? Uh, no, they do. So um, there's a, a place in Italy, I can't remember the name of it, it's somewhere in northern Italy, which seems to be quite important for, for birds to stop off and refuel. Generally, birds, when they're going south, it's it's they're, they're in no rush to get back. You know, they need to get back before, obviously, winter hits uh, and conditions change. But there isn't the same rush like there is in the spring because, you know, there's a rush to get back and breed and set up those territories. Um, so it's... It, it, they, these kind of really important areas probably aren't as important on the way back as they are going forwards. But yeah, for birds that take the Italy route, so some birds go via Italy and some birds go via Spain. And the ones that go via Italy, this place in northern Italy, whose name uh, escapes me, is uh, seems to be quite an important place to be fattening up before crossing the Sahara. And again, that's more more a question. I know I know some other species have started doing kind of weird things where they've decided they're not going to do their full migration anymore. You know, the conditions have kind of changed, and why go all that all that way? And we'll just kind of go to wherever suitable now. Are cuckoos doing that, or are they still still sticking to the same the full journey? It's full journey, yeah. They seem to be pretty rigid. You know, this uh, this. Um... Uh, paper that the BTO uh, published with this important staging ground, the fact that, you know, for whatever reason, they can't get the resources they need in the Congo, because, you know, to fly from the Congo to West Africa is a massive journey in itself. You know, that's a mini migration. You know, we, we forget how big Africa is. It's absolutely ginormous. So it's not just a hop from the Congo to, you know, to Nigeria. That's that's a hell of a journey. Um, but it must be that for whatever resources they're feeding on the Congo, 
Um, it's enough to kind of tide them over, but it's not enough to get them to the Sahara. And it's worth making that that trip across to West Africa for this boom period, which I imagine is probably termites. You know, once the rains hit, uh, you know, anyone, who, if you've ever been to Africa in areas where when the rains hit, the amount of termites that uh, then come out, you know, the wing termites that are the, uh, the, the next generation effectively is phenomenal. And, you know, if, if that's what the cuckoos are feeding on, then that's, you know, that's what will get them across the Sahara. It would be fascinating to know what they're feeding on at all these different stages and if it's different or the same. That'd be absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Another another question that's come in there is at the start you said that there was a kind of struggle to what group exactly to place cuckoos in. And somebody's asked, is there any sort of DNA work or DNA analysis um that's helping to place exactly where they should be? Ooh, I don't know. I'm no taxonomist. Um uh yeah, not that I know of. So when I was uh, doing a bit of research on this side of it for the talk, yeah, the my cuckoo book, the which is the cuckoos of the world, uh, just kind of placed them as an ancient lineage, which made me think that no, the genetic work hadn't been done, and they still weren't entirely sure. Yeah, that that certainly sounds like. I think I think that's one of the things with a lot, a lot of species is if they really are in a sort of bizarre group and nobody's done any of the background work around about that, even with all these fancy DNA techniques, it, it still takes quite a bit of effort to to work out all the right background to start placing things precisely. It's uh, mm -hmm. Somebody once said to me, you know, is DNA is really going to replace taxonomists? And somebody else said, no, really, you need both. If you don't have both working together to start placing these things, the new DNA stuff won't work either. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's definitely true mm -hmm. uh, as well. I'm just checking if I've had any other... Oh, one other question that I had near the start was the the other form, is it the rufous form of the cuckoo? Is there anywhere where that's the dominant form or is it always a sort of a, a rarity? That's a good question. N not that I know of. So I read something ages ago w uh, where someone had kind of surmised that... Um, let me get this in the right way around. That cuckoos... Cuckoos in more open habitats are uh, more likely to have the rufous form because they're trying to look like merlins. And then cuckoos in more um, uh, like scrubland habitats are maybe trying to look more like sparrowhawks, but that just doesn't add up because, you know, the dominant form by far everywhere is, is the grey form. So, no, not that I know of. Um, nowhere that it's dominant, but, yeah, certainly um, in some places it's more common uh, than, uh, than in Scotland. I've never seen a Rufus cuckoo. Yeah, I have to say, I didn't even know it was a thing. I have to, I have to say that, that that's something definitely to look out for. It, I think that's us at the end of questions. So thank you very much for that, James. That was an absolutely amazing um, talk. Okay. And so much, you actually answered one of my questions. It comes into my head, I think every time I see a cuckoo, <laughs> and then I forget, and that's how do they deal with those spiky caterpillars? I've <laughs> often thought of that. I thought oh, I must try to look that up, and I've never, I've never remembered to do it. So that is the question I've always wanted to see. And certainly, my first, I my first cuckoos I ever heard were in your calendar, but my first cuckoo I ever saw was exactly where you said up at Sheriff Muir uh, oh, when I was great. a student at Stirling Uni. That was exactly where I saw, I think, probably my first and second cuckoo, actually. So definitely, when it comes the right time of year, folks, that's a place to go up, up to Sheriff Muir, and there's some terrific wildlife up there. It's definitely one of our really good local sites as well. So thank you again so much for that, James. And uh, for everybody else, uh, 5th of December as well. And James, you're always welcome to be in the audience as well. 5th of December, we have our next talk as well. And that's on uh, the Seabirds of Scotland by Ali Lemon. So hopefully we'll see you all there. So thank you again, everybody. And thank you again, James. Cheers, everyone. Have a good Thanks, evening. Uh, Bye.